when I was studying with my grief educator course, that I finally was able to take that breath and release. There's nothing I could do to change it. Mm-hmm. And and we do suicide loss survivors beat ourselves up because we want to go back and change the past. And it's one of my meditation teachers that helped as well with that. You know, how much of your suffering is because you want to change the past? We cannot change the past. We can change our relationship with it. Welcome to YourBrilliance.com. I'm your host, Amy Waterman. About 45,000 Americans die each year by suicide, and many of those leave behind grieving spouses or partners. And although most of us know how to support someone through the death of a loved one, few of us know what to do in cases of suicide. Our guest for today, Michelle Ann Collins, experienced this firsthand when her husband passed away as a result of suicide. And despite her skills as a wellness coach and yoga therapist, she found herself in a dark place. Now she had friends who stepped in to help, but ultimately moving through that grief was a path that she had to follow alone. Now today, Michelle is an author and her latest books, Surviving Spouse or Partner Suicide Loss, and supporting a survivor of spouse or partner suicide loss are coming out January 26th. And she is here with us to share some of the tools that helped her in her journey through grief. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Amy. Always great to be with you. Oh, well, it's so good to see you again. And for those of you who follow my show, you might be recognizing Michelle right now. She was on the show three years ago to talk about the journey back to joy. So I'm going to make sure to include a link to that interview in the show notes. Michelle, let's start this at the beginning. So would you tell us a little bit about Glenn? Yes, I love to talk about him. Thank you. And that's one of the things that I talk about in my books that you mentioned are coming out. Sometimes people just move on. And as the grieving widow, you, you feel like bringing it up is bringing people down. And the love continues. So talking about Glenn is always a really sacred and joyful space for me now used to be not so joyful, but he was just such a life lover. He, he was fun and, you know, the life of the party and, and always planning something fun. I, I did more in my short marriage to him than I did in the 20 years previous to that, as far as travel and skiing and all these activities. And boy, he kept us busy, me me and the kids and, and laughing. Everything was always funny, even the way he ordered his sandwich. You know, he's not the kind of person who would say, hey, honey, will you make me a turkey sandwich? You know, he booms into the room and he says, prepare my sandwich, you know. (laughs) So, yeah, life with him was a riot and he was so passionate and such an amazing, loving man. So thank you for giving me the, the space to talk about him. I appreciate that. Well, what I really notice right now from that is how your memory of him is life. It's not death. It's, it's just sheer abundant life. And that's, you know, according to David Kessler, who taught my grief educator course, uh, I got a certification in grief education. It's not last year anymore, two years ago. Um, I, uh, his definition of healing or, or making the journey through grief is when you can remember your loved one with more love than pain. And I have gotten to that point. I mean, there's certainly all the memories of all the terrible times and the pain and of course his death and, and what happened after his death. But I can remember Glenn with a heart full of love because there was so much love and why wipe that off the planet when that was one of the the best parts of our time together. So, so let's go back then to the time you're talking about when it was chaos and it was just afterwards and you had so much to deal with. You had financial stuff, a lot of financial stuff to deal with. You had the estate and you had all those really difficult feelings. And one of the things you say in the book, which I, I found so interesting is you say that if somebody had handed you a book on healing at that point, you couldn't even read it because you were just trying to survive. 
So what did you need in those early days and weeks right after the loss? Um, great question. Thanks. Uh, what I needed was someone to just let me know I was okay or I was going to be okay and make space for me to be miserable in what in the books I refer to it as the grief cave. You can't drag somebody out of their grief cave. People need to spend time in that dark, miserable place because that's part of grief. That doesn't mean you're sick. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. You know, I, I think I would have needed someone to just say, it's okay. If you need to stay in bed and cry all day, I'll take care of what, what you need taken care of. And it's okay. And even three months later, you know, six months later, um, I realize it's a six month anniversary. It must be a hard day for you. Uh, what can I do for you? How can, how can I support you? And, and just not pushing me through my grief, not dragging me out of the cave, like I said, and, and then just noticing when I'm ready for that next step, noticing when I'm ready. Well, do you think you might be able to drive today? If not, I'll take you to the grocery store or I'll go for you. But maybe tomorrow you could actually go to the grocery store by yourself. Maybe not, you know, and just that full acceptance and support for the place I am right now. And also the reassurance, you're not always going to feel the way you do right now. Because when you're in those early stages, you really feel like your life is over. You, you feel like everything is bad. Everything hurts. I'll never love again. I'll never feel good again. It, it, and, and that's just not true. But you feel like it's true at the time. One really hard thing um, for people supporting someone is seeing their loved one's guilt. Because when you look at it from the outside, you think, you know, how irrational is that guilt, right? Because there's nothing they could have done. They couldn't have done anything, but their loved one still feels it anyway. And you talk a little bit about that feeling in the book. How did you deal with that survivor's guilt? And how did you get your way to the other side? Yeah, I guilt is is definitely one of the hardest parts. Uh, and I think that there's guilt or what I've learned from studying grief is there's often guilt in every kind of death, not just suicide. But people will will make things up. I mean, it is it's your your creative thinking mind, your your, you know, irrational mind saying, oh, if only I had gotten my mom's nails done again, she would have lived longer, you know, things like that. If only I wouldn't have opened the door when my grandmother left and got in her car and then got in that accident, she wouldn't be dead. You know, so people have this fan fan fantasy or fantastical thinking around death. Um, and I talk a little bit about the neuroscience behind that too in my book, because it's very natural. But with suicide, there's just that extra layer. What, what did I miss? What else could I have done? Uh, because you really think you can prevent suicide. And there is a very robust community of, of therapists and coaches all over the world that are in suicide prevention. And they are successful. I'm not saying it's not possible. But the day after the suicide, it's not possible to prevent the suicide. And the day before the suicide, you didn't know it was going to happen tomorrow. So blaming yourself, and there's even, you know, there's institutions that are specifically designed with round the clock care and no sharp instruments to take care of people to prevent suicide where there are still suicides. So it's when I started learning that to answer your question that I began to be able to let go. It's when I started, when I was studying with my grief educator course that I finally was able to take that breath and release. There's nothing I could do to change it. Mm -hmm. And, and we do suicide loss survivors beat ourselves up because we want to go back and change the past. And it's one of my meditation teachers that helped as well with that, you know, how much of your suffering is because you want to change the past. We cannot change the past. We can change our relationship with it, 
So once I accepted that, that was a big boost to my being able to release the guilt. Oh, it's so, so important to deal with the emotional side. But one of the things I learned from your book was that it's not just an emotional shock, but it actually affects the body. Trauma is actually a physical experience as well as an emotional one. So could you share a little bit of, of the actual physical symptoms that can emerge from this kind of loss? Yeah. Uh, the, and, and it's, it's so many different, like some people, Brene Brown talks about um, overdoers and underdoers. Uh, and she's talking more about, you know, your reaction to shame, but shame is also wrapped up in suicide loss. So uh some people just go supernova, you know, they're, they're cleaning the house and doing all the errands and, and just constant activity. Um, the more common are people who sort of shut down and it, you, your digestion shuts down, your immune system sh shuts down. You, you might be really anxious or really depressed feeling, um, a lot of times you, it feels so heavy. I use the image of a, a backpack that you're carrying, uh, full of rocks where you just getting out of bed and putting on your shoes is so effortful. You feel like you ran a marathon. And so stress in general will, will interfere with, it can raise your blood pressure. It can raise heart rate, lower immunity, lower digestion, make it in, uh, difficult to sleep, difficult to think clearly and trauma, the trauma of finding your loved one after they've died by suicide or, or even just discovering that there was a suicide, maybe not the seeing the body, um, can send you into that trauma response and of all of those things happening. And then there's another layer where you can just disappear, just separate from your body. It's called dissociation where your nervous system is so overwhelmed by the exposure that, that it's had that you just leave. You're not there. And victims of, of abuse of rape and things like that describe that PTSD, um, military people talk about that. It's you just dissociate your body's like, Nope. Or your mind is no, nope, I'm not here. This is too much for me. So I'm going to go elsewhere and I'll come back later and check it out. See if I can come back safely. One of the things I liked, you talked about, um, some coping strategies and one of the coping strategies you talked about was permission slips. Could you tell us a little bit about those? Okay. That's another one I have to give Brene Brown credit for. Um, and I do, I do reference her in my book. Uh, it, sometimes we are so hard on ourselves. And in, when I answered your first question about what do I wish I had at the beginning, just the permission, it's okay to be where you are. And I wanted to really emphasize that. And this can, this can be true of any big challenge in life. It doesn't have to be suicide loss or grief, uh, but just to accept, okay, I am where I am today. I can't get out of bed today and I'm not going to. And I'm giving myself permission because so often when we have a tragedy like this, um, not that we often have a tragedy like this, but so often when we're going through a difficult time, we add pain to pain by being hard on ourselves about it. And so I was working with a, a client just the other day and we, we did this meditation on her being her own best friend. Mm. You know, you're laying there in bed, harshing on yourself, shooting on yourself, for, for, and not being able to do anything, would your best friend come in and say, yeah, you should be whatever your list in your mind is. What if you treat yourself like you're your best friend for a minute? Oh. I mean, right. You're just mm -hmm. like, oh, I could be nice to me. And that would lighten my burden so much. I, I love that. I love that. That and and on the supporter side as well. That what a survivor needs is a friend rather than uh, uh, somebody who's going to get them through to the other side manually, pick them up and carry them. Sometimes it's just friendship is what's needed. 
Yeah. I mean, grief journey, it's a solo journey. You can get support and help, but nobody can do your grieving for you. Nobody can bring you back into your body. If you've dissociated, you have to get there yourself. So that's why it's so important when you feel good enough to read, to be able to have a resource like my book or listen to, you know, a YouTube video or, or a podcast where these types of things can get into your brain when you're, when you're able to absorb it and, and try some of the practices so that when you do have a really tough time, you already have a little bit of a toolbox created. Oh. Now, for those of you watching, if you are interested in getting your own toolbox or learning more about how to support a survivor, then Michelle's books might be exactly what you need. So to get your copies, go to yourbrilliance.org slash survive. That's yourbrilliance.org slash survive. Michelle, thank you so much for coming onto the show. And I wondered if there was any last message you would like to leave our viewers with. Oh, goodness. Um, probably number one, just take a deep breath once in a while. You don't have to do everything right now. It's okay to just sit and breathe. And there's support, whatever you need support for. I mean, Amy's there to support you with all sorts of different, really important things. I'm waiting for your next email because you left a little, a little <laughs> teaser in there today. Um, you can get help, get, ask for help and then receive it when you need help. Oh. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being on the show. And thank you all of there out there for watching. Now for more interviews like these, make sure to subscribe to Your Brilliance TV here on YouTube, and then come on over to yourbrilliance.com for more tips and insights on how you can live your most brilliant life. See you next time.